it into something he wouldn't have understood or recognized, something called Jesus Christ. It's a different thing. It was what happened, what the Christians did to Rabbi Yeshua over that century and a half of turning him around and, and throttling the essential Jewishness out of him in order to make the very anti-Semitic arguments that are in the New Testament, as in John 8.44, when Jesus apparently says to the Jews, you have the devil for your, your, your father or brother, whatever it is, and you can do no good because there is no good in you. The New Testament is a, there's a lot of poisonous anti-Semitic venom in the New Testament. So far from seeing love and all of these things that you and Dr. Craig have asserted, the historians see a document that gets progressively more anti-Semitic. So in terms of loving people, this has to be done against and in spite of the hatred of the New Testament rather than the politics. <laughs> I think that shows a misunderstanding of the New Testament. Uh, the, the polemicizing that goes on in the Gospel of John against the Jews, you must remember that this is taking place among Jews. The, the earliest Christians were Jews, and John was a Jew, and, and Jesus was a Jew. So this is very typical sort of family squabble that you can show in other Jewish writings where they uh, argue with each other and debate with each other in this way. This is not anti-Semitism in the modern sense that you have exhibited, say, in National Socialist Germany or, or uh, anti-Semitic societies of that nature. And as for Jesus becoming the Christ, the word Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's the Greek word for Messiah. And I think that there are very good grounds for thinking that Jesus of Nazareth thought that he was the Jewish Messiah. In fact, I was talking to Carol Ludemann at the Society of Biblical Literature a couple of years ago, and Ludemann said to me, I don't see how you can explain the evidence any other way than that Jesus of Nazareth thought that he was the Jewish Messiah. He claimed to be the unique Son of God and the Son of Man prophesied by Daniel, the prophet in the seventh chapter of, the, of his prophecy. He rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey uh, to herald, herald uh, from the crowds of the kingdom of God coming in fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah in the Old Testament. Now, he may have been deluded. You can say that he was out of his mind. But it was very clear that he was deliberately claiming to be the long-promised Jewish Messiah. If you're interested in learning more about this, take a look at my book, Reasonable Faith. It has a chapter on the self-understanding of Jesus that deals with the current uh, state of New Testament scholarship on this issue. Uh, that was a question for Dr. Craig. So question for Dr. Craig. Ray. Yes. I'll speak up loudly. Uh, but then people in the other rooms will not be able oh. to see him. <laughs> Another professor of philosophy is not going to trust me. Say, say what he means. A question for Dr. Craig pertaining to his argument on the objectivity of moral values. Now, we need to know exactly what he means by objective moral values, and I would like to cite, let's say, just three instances of what I would take to be objective moral values, if there any are any such. One. Thou shalt not, or if you like, it is morally wrong to wantonly slaughter innocent people. Two, it is morally wrong to order others to wantonly slaughter innocent people. And I'll take the third one of his own choosing. It is morally wrong to torture innocent children or innocent people. Okay? I have argued in a paper published in Farsi, among other languages, titled A Moral Argument for Atheism, that if any of those three principles that I've just enunciated are indeed objective moral principles, then if objective moral values exist, God does not exist 
because he violates all three. And I'll give Dr. Crane chapter and verse for each if he so desires. Okay, thank you. Great. Dr. Bradley is an esteemed uh, philosopher that I first met in Canada, and so uh, he could well be a participant in the tonight's debate. Um, I think that although these are uh, objective moral values for human beings, which are in fact the result of God's uh, issuing commandments of this sort, that God himself doesn't have moral duties because he doesn't issue commands to himself. I think our moral obligations are constituted by God's commands. So, for example, it would be wrong for Ray Bradley to leap from his seat and plunge a knife into my heart and kill me. This would be wrong. But if God wants to strike me dead right now, that's his prerogative. God is the author and giver of life, and he has under no moral obligation whatsoever to prolong my life for one second further. I exist simply by his grace and his pleasure. Now, I would agree that God would not order others to wantonly slaughter innocent people, but I don't think that the chapters and verses you would give about probably the conquest of Canaan in the Old Testament is a matter of wanton slaughter. I think that there uh, it represented God's judgment upon those nations in the same way that Israel herself was later judged by God when the Babylonian and Assyrian armies swept in and, and conquered Israel. Um, so, oh, one last thing I would want to say about that too, I think, Ray, is this, is that this isn't really an argument against theism or, or an argument for atheism. This is an argument against biblical infallibility. It's to say that these stories in the Bible about the Canaanite conquest cannot be true of God, and therefore the conclusion would be either these are legends about the founding of Israel that never happened, or else Israel carried away by fervent nationalism, thought God was on their side and did things that God couldn't have commanded. Now, I don't in fact think that's true, but what I am suggesting is that even if your argument goes through, it doesn't prove atheism, it just would at least prove uh, or disprove biblical infallibility. Can I come back? Well, that's well, after so, uh, yes, I think we will allow uh, just one comeback. <laughs> <laughs> As you know very well, Bill, having debated the question, can a loving God send people to hell with me in 1994, a transcript of which, by the way, is available <laughs> website, uh, reasonfaith.org. Yes. <laughs> it's my website. So. <laughs> the issue that exercised me in that debate had to do with God sending people to hell. And a hell, furthermore, in which, according to the book of Revelation, all whose names were not written in the book of life will be tortured in the lake of brimstone and sulfur, and the smoke of their torment will ascend forever and ever with divine lookers on, namely the Lamb, the person of Jesus, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth forever and ever. Jesus, who is purported to be the exemplar of all that is moral, God is love and all that jazz, is the person to whom we owe the doctrine of a fiery hell. There are other concepts of hell, but the doctrine of a fiery hell is that of Jesus. In the book of Matthew alone, there are 13 passages in which he speaks of <laughs> which he speaks of a fiery hell. Um, now, if that doesn't count as torture, I don't know what does. There is no greater evil in my book than that of torture of innocent people for the simple sin of non-belief. Of course, on the Christian view, these aren't innocent people. Uh, so that is, that's uh, neither here nor there. Uh, I would say, moreover, 
that the essence of hell is separation from God.